Just minutes after takeoff, fire breaks out in the cabin of a DC-9. The pilots lose control, and the plane plunges nose first into the Everglades. That nose drop occurred, I realized it was going to crash. An MD-11 crashes after smoke mysteriously fills the cockpit. The airplane was burning up around them. Two and a half hours into a flight, a DC-9 fills with smoke and loses all of its electrical systems. So we're on a, a mayday, we're going down. We thought everybody could get off because, like I say, there wasn't any screen. And moments after takeoff, flames erupt from the world's most iconic aircraft. It was a, a time bomb. They were going to die. People watch in horror as it crashes into a nearby hotel. There are many ways for fires to start on a plane. There are not many ways to put them out. In-flight fires can be one of the most catastrophic events a uh, flight crew can face. The United States Federal Aviation Administration has found that nearly one flight a day is diverted due to smoke or fire in flight. It can be one of the most dangerous situations facing any flight crew. The FAA has done extensive testing on in-flight fires and their research said you may have as little as 20 minutes to get the fire under control or you may lose control of the airplane. Over the years, aircraft have become heavily protected against fire. Materials are tested for flammability. Smoke detectors are installed throughout, but these precautions are the product of hard lessons. Fires often start in areas of the plane that are not visible to the crew. Dramatic animations show where these hidden infernos can start, making you an eyewitness to the disaster unfolding. And it can unfold very quickly as in the case of an MD-11 that crashed into the Atlantic Ocean minutes after smoke entered the cockpit. On September the 2nd, 1998, passengers on board Swiss Air Flight 111 are making their way from New York to Geneva. The plane is over the Canadian coast when the pilots smell smoke in the cockpit. Bill Pickrell is the air traffic controller that day and the last person to have contact with Flight 111. We were at the end of the shift. At approximately 10:15 uh, p.m. local time, we were advised by one of the other sectors in the center that a Swiss Air flight had declared a pan because of smoke in the cockpit. A pan call indicates urgency that is not immediately life-threatening. As a precaution, Swiss Air 111 is cleared for an emergency landing at Halifax Airport in Nova Scotia. It appeared initially to be a fairly straightforward operation. The radio transmission was very professional, very calm. There was no indication of a sense of urgency. As they prepare for their descent, the smoke in the cockpit becomes heavier. Amid the growing danger, the pilots are faced with a difficult decision. The pilot advised that they needed to dump fuel. At that point, they were approximately uh, 16,000 feet. The fuel dump uh, complicated the situation uh, greatly. It's a good decision to get the airplane as light as you can. It's easier on the airplane. But delaying the landing could put the flight in even more danger. The passengers have been told that they are being diverted, but there is no smoke in the cabin, and they have no idea that inside the cockpit something is going horribly wrong. Following the smoke checklist, the pilots shut off power to the cabin. If there's an electrical fire, this could cut power to the source. But the smoke only gets thicker. Then, the autopilot fails. Flying the plane by hand, in the dark, the pilots put on their oxygen masks. By this point, they knew they had a very serious situation. And they needed on the ground as rapidly as, as possible. As soon as they were over the water was when I suggested that they could commence their fuel dump. And that was also the time, um, unknown to me, that the aircraft began experiencing a, a series of critical systems failures. The plane begins to lose altitude. Within a minute, they had lost several critical systems. They lost the radio contact. 
and very soon after that we lost the transponder. Inside the cockpit, a nightmare scenario is unfolding. Fire has breached the ceiling, dripping molten aluminium onto the flight deck. They lose control of the plane and plunge into the ocean at 345 miles an hour. The impact is tremendous. There are no survivors. The plane shatters and only small traces remain floating on the surface. The rest disappears into the Atlantic. It is clearly now not a rescue mission, but a recovery mission. Puzzled by the tragedy, investigators are eager to retrieve the wreckage. We knew that if we found the source of that in-flight fire and the fuel that was feeding that in-flight fire, that we would get to the safety issues that we needed to identify. But the answers to questions about how it started and what burned are scattered on the ocean floor. Some uh, 185 or 90 feet below the surface of the ocean and spread out. And uh, we didn't know exactly where it was. We didn't know exactly what we were faced with in trying to recover it. The first challenge is to find the black boxes. We managed to go in and locate and recover the two black boxes. It was a setback because the fire, in fact, had burned both of those flight data recorder and cockpit voice recorder about six minutes before the aircraft actually hit the water. It was pretty disappointing. With no new information about the final six minutes, investigators are forced to rely on the wreckage for answers. It's not necessarily standard practice to rebuild an airplane to be able to solve the riddle of what happened. In our particular case, that was really the only way we were going to be able to do it was to take the pieces that we were able to recover and then identify and place them back into a structure that resembled the uh, original airplane. So we could basically look for fire patterns on the burn pieces that we had and then try and trace the fire to its origin. But how could fire breach the cockpit, the most protected area of the aircraft? The answers shocked the aviation industry. We had indications that there was insulation cover material in the airplane that had burned. It didn't look like this stuff should burn at all. But we said very quickly after that that this material is what spread the fire, what made it so hot, and in fact what made that airplane crash into the ocean. In 1998, thousands of planes were taking to the skies full of the same insulation. There was fire uh, damage in the area over the flight deck. And this surprised them because there's testing done to ensure that these thermal acoustic blankets do not burn easily. And yet there was fire damage. We took some of this material and touched the mask to it. And lo and behold, we discovered that it burned. And not only did it burn, it burned completely and it burned hot and it burned smoky. Investigators race to find out what ignited the insulation before another aircraft is affected. Coming up, will millions of pieces of wreckage yield answers before it's too late? Swiss Air Flight 111 on its way from New York to Geneva falls from the sky and into the Atlantic Ocean near Nova Scotia, just minutes after the crew reports smoke in the cockpit. In the search to find out what went wrong, investigators discover that a common aircraft insulation material is a fire hazard. Thousands of planes are refitted with new insulation and flammability testing is re-evaluated, but they still don't know how the fire started and if other aircraft are at risk. When we started to look for potential ignition sources, the very first thing that comes to mind is aircraft wiring. The investigators scour more than 150 miles of wiring for signs of an electrical malfunction called arcing. Arcing events are when electricity jumps from a wire to a, another piece of metal. It can be another wire or it can be a, a part of the airplane or something else. When it does that, it, it, has, it can create a tremendous amount of heat. Finding an arcing event is difficult and determining if one preceded another is nearly impossible. But six months into writing the final reports, the impossible happens. We managed to come up with a wire bundle that was in fact involved in the lead event. 
The investigators identified two microscopic points on a wire and determined that they were the first to experience a fault. But it's still unclear why they malfunctioned and how they caused the crash. The MD-11 was one of the very early airplanes to have personal in-flight entertainment. And so in the, in the first class cabin area, this system drew a lot of power and on this type of airplane. It has individual power supplies for the cabin as well as the different parts of the flight deck. When the system was installed into the aircraft, it was wired into the cockpit, drawing power from the same source as the flight controls. Under normal conditions, an in-flight entertainment system arcing event and fire would be controllable because they would be able to shut off electricity to it. Unfortunately, in the case of Swiss Air 111, they were unable to do that. Wear and tear on the entertainment system wiring created an opening that allowed electricity to jump out. The arc occurred right next to the wires that powered the flight deck's most crucial equipment, setting off a fire that spread across the cockpit attic, burning through the ceiling. The situation as in the final few minutes of flight was catastrophic. The airplane's full of smoke. There is evidence of molten aluminum that's being rained down from the fire overhead. The electrical systems are failing. Pneumatic systems are failing. One by one, everything that they need to keep the airplane in flight is failing. And they finally lose control of the airplane. And it rolls toward the ocean and accelerates and impacts the ocean at a very high speed. In the wake of the Swiss Air 111 crash, the airline industry is forced to reevaluate the procedures for in flight fires. Flammability testing becomes more rigorous. Insulation blankets are manufactured from more flame resistant materials, and the certification and maintenance of wiring becomes more stringent. The Swiss Air 111 was a watershed event in how pilots deal with in flight smoke and fire uh, conditions. After that, pilots recognized how quickly things could go wrong. What makes fire such a lethal threat to aircraft is its ability to start and grow undetected. In some cases, the interiors of the plane are at risk, but a fire that starts outside can be just as catastrophic. Charles de Gaulle Airport, Paris. Concorde, the world's only supersonic passenger jet, speeds down the runway at over 175 miles per hour. Just before the nose wheel lifts, flames erupt from under the left wing. Eyewitnesses see the low-flying plane move unsteadily through the sky, with an inferno trailing behind it. Just two minutes after takeoff, the most famous passenger aircraft in the world crashes into a hotel. They were doomed. They fought until the last moment, but uh, they could do nothing. July the 25th, 2000, Air France Flight 4590 is preparing for takeoff from Paris's Charles de Gaulle Airport on its way to New York. Other air traffic gives way, and people stop to watch as Concorde prepares for takeoff. No one realizes they are about to witness a disaster. The airplane is going right down the runway. The tower tells the pilots, hey, you've got fire behind the aircraft. They get a cockpit warning indication that there is a fire, believed to be a fire, in the number two engine. But once the plane reaches a critical speed, it cannot stop. The pilot's best hope is to get airborne so they can deal with the problem. Typically for a pilot, whenever you have a problem and you're committed to flight, which this crew was, they want to climb to what they call a safe altitude before they really start taking corrective action. But the Concorde's ability to fly has been compromised by the fire. He had started to lose directional control. When you got the airplane flying, he's heavy, low, and slow. That is a very critical point for a pilot. A minute after takeoff, the number two engine fails the pilots begin to go through the engine fire procedure. In the cockpit, they're starting to get warnings. They've been told by the control tower that they have fire. So for a pilot, they go, hmm, I have a fire in the number two engine. But the situation is not what the pilots suspect. Desperately trying to get enough speed to stay airborne, they attempt to pull up the landing gear. 
they selected the undercarriage up, but it wouldn't come up because the left-hand undercarriage had been damaged by the fire. They were not in a position to continue level flight, and at that point, they realized they needed on the ground at the closest airport, which was Leverger. It wasn't a good choice, but it was the best choice that they 